What's up, everyone? Welcome. We are on Cannabis right now, and we are broadcasting to the internet on YouTube and on Spotify and everywhere else. And today we have a great episode for you today. We have Tad Hussey from Kiss Organics, and we're going to be talking all about organic growing. We're going to be talking about how you can grow and, and grow some great uh, product this uh, summer and fall in your outdoors. We're going to be talking about backyard growing um, and all that kind of stuff. And so... Um, before we get too far into it, I need to give some shout outs, but I just wanted to mention super excited about this show and uh, it's going to really help me get ready for my outdoor grow season, which I'm just starting to get ready for right now. But um, again, before we get too far into it, I want to shout out our Cannabis community. It's our membership community. If you enjoy this show and you want to support the Cannabis channel, you can join us in our community. Search Cannabis in the App Store and use the code GrowersLove for 50% off. You can join for $4.20 a month. We do giveaways at the end of uh, every show and at the end of every month. Uh, so if you want to be a part of that, search Cannabis in the App Store. I also want to give a quick shout out to Lost Coast Plant Therapy. Uh, they sponsored this uh, show and are, are they've been with us for several months now. And it's a great uh, organic spray that you can use to fight botrytis, powdery mildew, bugs, all sorts of things. So check out lostcoastplanttherapy.com. And uh, I'll throw it over to JR for shout outs to our friends at Neptune and Tiki. Excellent. Well, uh, Tiki's wrapping up his March Madness sale, forty uh, percent off all month long on his Tiki site. And then uh, for Neptune Seed Bank, I'm featuring the Mega Robot, which is Mega OG uh, by Raw Genetics, and the Mega OG is Skywalker OG by Pave. And that Skywalker cut he's had for a very long time, and it's a stellar cut. So I'm excited. I'm hunting a few of those, so. Uh, we'll have some more uh, to talk about when Brad comes on here in a few weeks. Awesome. So, again, thanks to our supporters, but thanks to our uh, our special guest today, Tad. Like I said, um, Tad's with Kiss Organics. If you're not familiar with Kiss Organics, they're um, I think they're also a physical store, but I'm mostly familiar with the online store part of it because I've not made it up uh, up into Washington and visited you guys in person. But uh, just such a great wealth of information, great products. Uh, you know, when you're buying stuff from Tad, that he's really looking for stuff that's high quality and that's um, going to work well for you. So we're really excited to be connecting with Tad uh, today on the show. Welcome to the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, well um, yeah, uh, yeah. JR, you kick us off with the first question. Yeah, Tad, we always like to start off by asking our guests uh, how they fell in love with the plant and how it's kind of led them to where they are today. Sure, I'd probably going to give you a, a pretty unique answer in this regard. So I uh, didn't get into the cannabis industry until I was a little bit older. I was probably like 28 at the time. And I had just come back from Australia with a master's degree uh, in an unrelated field. And I started working with my father on uh, compost tea brewers and, and selling compost tea. And I kept getting phone calls. The guys were like, hey, I got 30 tomatoes in my basement. I want to use compost tea. And I realized pretty quickly what they were actually growing. Um, you know, and this was this was a while ago now. This was back in oh, 2005, I'd say. So uh, I, at that point, I'd never even tried cannabis. And so I started reading about it um, through this angle of, of learning more about it and realizing there was a lot of misinformation out there behind the science of compost teas. And I decided I wanted to start growing. And that's when I really got into it and learning about this plant. I don't have the same endocannabinoid uh, system that a lot of you know users and and growers have. It just doesn't hit me the same way. Um, it makes me really <laughs> really sleepy and couch locked and unproductive, uh, and I'll eat everything in sight. So I uh, I have to be pretty selective when I when I do use cannabis. And so for me, what what I'm really passionate about is the science of organic cultivation. And that's what makes cannabis such a cool crop because there's so much that we're constantly learning about it. And that's why I started the podcast. Awesome. Well, I know you, you, your family has a background in growing and just in the space. Could you give us um, a little bit of the backstory there? Cause I think that's, 
something that I remember hearing about on the show and you bring it up every once in a while. I think it comes up sometimes when you talk about Clackamas Coot because didn't he know like your dad or something like that? I don't know. I'm probably messing up the story here, but <laughs> yeah. And also hitting my mic. Okay. Um, but yeah, let me know. Uh, I would love to just hear the backstory. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up with my parents owning a nursery and landscape business. So I was around plants my whole life. Um, went off to college, came back, uh, had trouble figuring out what I wanted to do with my life, you know, pretty similar story to everyone. And so um, my my dad had started this compost tea business and was working with Dr. Elaine Ingham and Earth Fortifications. He was one of the very first soil food web advisors. He had one of the first compost commercially available compost tea brewers, and he had done it, did a ton of testing on it. Uh, and through him, I met Elaine Ingham. I met Jeff Lowenfels. Um, a lot of the people in the soul food web community. And then through that, when I started looking at for compost tea information online, because there was so much misinformation, I ended up on IC Mag in the organic soil section. And that's where I met Coot and uh, Tim Wilson, who's also known as Microbe Man. Uh, Jeremy from Build a Soil was in there. There was a bunch of us uh, back in the day. And so that was really where it all started. And then Coot being in Oregon, not that far away um, from you, uh, JR, I actually would drive down there and have, you know, have lunch with them and pick up supplies. And I, that's what sparked a lot of what Kiss Organics is, is because I wanted to make my own soil. And at that time, you know, this was before anyone was doing this. Um, I couldn't find, you know, kelp meal or fish meal or bone meal, any of these things in small amounts you know, or if I could even find them at all. And so, um, I, that was where we got the idea to start selling things in, cause everything's a 50 pound bag or a giant 2000 pound tote. So that's when we, we came up with the idea of diversifying from compost tea. We started experimenting with soil, started getting amendments. And that's where, um, I think Kiss Organics really started. Yeah. And the, the knowledge sharing that you, you know, um, if folks haven't, um, aren't familiar with you. Um, you're just always sharing knowledge with the community, whether it's through your podcast, you're super active on YouTube. Now I noticed you're doing, I think you yeah. did a show like last night. Um, like you're, you're, you're just sharing more and more knowledge and also, and you're breaking down like the individual ingredients, which is really helpful just for, so folks really understand what goes into each one of those pieces. Um, but JR, you had the next question, I think. Yeah, um, I see people kind of making this movement towards simplicity and um, kind of creating food sources for their plants that are very local to them. Or even some are even talking about the cannabis plant and all of its life cycle produces all the nutrition that a cannabis plant would need. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that, that's a great question. And I think it's a little bit of a complicated answer because yes, there's a lot of nutrients in the cannabis plant. It's a hyper accumulator. We know that it, it accumulates a lot of nutrients. It accumulates a lot of heavy metals and uh, pretty much everything that's in that soil. So to simplify it in terms of reusing the cannabis plant to grow another cannabis plant, um, we've kind of moved away from that idea just because of that heavy metal load. Um, there's going to be using organic soil. There's going to be, you know, a little bit of lead, a little bit of arsenic, cadmium, all of these things. And there's going to be tiny amounts in a lot of the amendments we use. Uh, you mentioned kelp meal. Kelp meal actually tends to be a lot higher in arsenic. So if we do use it, we use it in very low levels. Um, and that's one of the reasons I don't reuse. I pull the roots root ball after, after the end of the cycle, if I'm reusing my soil and I don't compost that biomass back into my cannabis soil. That being said, um, this idea that we can get our nutrients from the plant and put it back into the soil is absolutely true. But one thing to consider is every time we harvest a plant, we're removing organic matter and we're removing nutrients. So those do need to be replaced. You know, even if you're just taking the flowers, you're still removing organic matter and you're still removing, um, nutrients. It's not a closed system. So over time, 
you know, even if you're composting the plant back in, you would start to see nutrient imbalances and deficiencies, uh, I would expect, unless you're adding some kind of fertilizer. And that could be KNF stuff, Jadam, you know, compost, all those things have fertility. So you may be, you may be adding nutrients and not even realizing it too. Um, kind of to what I was saying earlier about, um, how you kind of break down the individual ingredients and how all this stuff works. I think, um, one of the great values that you bring to the scene and the conversation is um, kind of fighting back the quote unquote bro science and bringing in real, real grow science. And just, you know, you, you often reference things that have been published or, you know, studies that have been done or, or what have you. So, um, and also I just, I noticed recently you spoke at, it was like a soil conference. I think it was right. One of the organic soil conferences or something like that. So can you, can you speak to, I guess I have two questions. One is why is that important? Could you just like give, if people are like, if they've been doing the bro science way or they've been doing the, not necessarily call it bro science, but let's just say, however they were taught, they're doing it. It's not broke. Don't fix it or whatever in their mind. Why should they, why is this kind of conversation relevant to them? Do you think? And kind of this new way of, of, of growing, so to speak. And then also I'd be curious if there's one example that comes to mind where we're actually learning that some of those, uh, an old technique of sorts, um, was actually right. I'd be curious. Yeah. So there's, there's a few things there. Um, the big thing for me and, and Kiss Organics is we want to take a science-based approach. Just because we're using organics doesn't mean that we can't still use science, I think. And that's something that seems to be a little bit of a, 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 a misnomer floating around the industry. And I also think that a lot of the science out there, stuff that appears to be science, a lot of it can really just be marketing. Um, and so you really have to look at what you know, where people are coming from and why they're saying what they're saying. And I think that applies to the stuff that I share too. Um, and so, yeah, we, we really try to take research, but not just any research. We want to get peer reviewed research and we want to make sure that that research is a applying to the crop that we're actually growing. So I can't go just pull a paper that was written about corn and assume that the same thing will happen in cannabis. Uh, so uh, I guess to answer your question, I think there's a lot there that we can do, um, that we can find if we, if, if we can track down the research or we can do our own research ourselves. So I encourage people to do, you know, AB testing to come up with a hypothesis and, and use scientific methodology in their own grow and try things out. Uh, cause the ultimate goal for me and what I think for a lot of growers are, is like you mentioned, to simplify the process limit the amount of inputs that you're having to put in because that reduces variability and it also limits the amount of money that you have to spend to grow a high quality crop it's really easy to fall for like these these marketing claims out there you know that you need to buy this must hype product but at the end of the day a lot of those things when you look into them it's just the same ingredients and amendments that you that you find that have been in the industry for a long time oh you asked no, have you seen like some validations in some of the older techniques that you learned from your father and maybe cooting them that actually have come to fruition in the science that you're studying? Can you give an example maybe? Yeah, I just did a, a recent interview with a post-grad student who did some research on lighting. And basically what they found was that 12 hours was pretty optimal for most cannabis genetics, but not all. Uh, in terms of a, a flowering period. And in some genetics, you could actually shorten that that DLI to um, 11 hours and get an even better result, but not all genetics. So that it actually fit that what they found was the the greatest range was actually that 12 hours that you know, we've been using for years. Um, also things like uh, Sea of Green or Scrogging has really been sort of validated this idea that Canopy determines yield more so than, you know, plant count or any other variable uh, in regards to how we're planting our plants. So there, there's a few things. We've done some research around communal planting and found that putting multiple plants in the same container or bed actually out yielded plants grown individually, which would fit with what the science shows about how um, 
plants can can work synerg synergistically in the soil and exchange root exudates and other things and have better access to root space. So there's there's a few examples there. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Let's see. So we had let's well, this is this next question that JR just threw in is one of his favorite topics. Uh, he calls it synganics. Um, I think it's like a terminology that kind of the dude grows guys have kind of coined and thrown around, which is kind of this idea of using synthetic nutrients and organic growing styles together simultaneously. Um, do you think that works well? I know there's often, um, you know, concerns about using quote unquote salt based nutrients that will somehow hurt the microbiology, the stuff on the organic side. Like what's your thoughts on that kind of growing style, if you will? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a hardcore organic guy. Like I don't use any, it gets a little tricky because the definition of organics is not very accurate. So I, I'm primarily an organics guy. I say I'll use certain things like potassium silicate in my grow, which is not technically organic, but it's approved for use in organic production. Uh, same with things like gypsum, calcium sulfate. It's a sulfate, but it's it's perfectly fine to use. It's a mine product. So I don't I, I think we have to talk about it from from a science-based perspective. And basically what science tells us is that um, mineral salts in low, low levels will feed microbes. And we know that by using mineral salts, you could just look at what they're doing in the giant pumpkin community. You know, they're all growing in that methodology. So if we're talking about just pure yield, um, yeah, I think that's probably the most viable way to go. If we want to talk about reusing the soil and being more sustainable or trying to get the best cannabinoid expression, um, I think organics really brings that to the table. So if you're a chem grower and, and you don't want to just grow the same weed that everyone else is growing using the same commercial bottle nutrient line, I think incorporating in some organic practices will help bring out a little bit different expression and bring different things to the table through that microbial interaction that would be uh, really beneficial. So yeah, I don't... I I, I think did. a lot of guys are getting turned on to that, Pat, especially in the hash and rosin community, because uh, those terpene numbers and that expressions, those things really account at the end of the day. And so a lot of the guys that were used to running just hydro are now starting to implement more uh, bio or organic solutions. And then the guys that were running maybe living soil, they're just going straight living or we're running, you know, turning, burning soil are now going to living soil because they're actually seeing the results in, in, in winds and stuff like that. Yeah. That's really what we experiment where we specialize in is, is living soil. So yeah, that's why I feel most comfortable. Well, talking that's, about. well, that's great. Cause that's what we're going to talk about now is, uh, we're going to talk about, um, before we jump into, um, how folks can build up their soil, either reamending soil that they already have or building soil in preparation for this outdoor season. Um, I wanted to ask you some quick questions about the soil that you provide on your site. Cause you do provide, like several different kinds. They all look great. <laughs> they all look um, really interesting. So if if someone, um, if the kind of the idea of building your own soil, so to speak, is kind of too much and they want to buy a product from you, what should they check out? What might they see on your site? And could you kind of talk us through what some of those things are? Yeah. So like I said, when KISS started, we were just doing compost tea and then we started, I started making my own soils and then I, I partnered up with a local grower and we started doing experiments with uh, reusing soils and things like that because he found it, it was working way better for him than using bottled nutrients. And then I don't know if you remember back in the day, but like trying to move soil out of your grow house at yes. like three o'clock in the morning and bringing in new soil was so sketchy. So we, we, we had to figure out a way to reuse it. And we've really nailed that now with soil testing and other methods. But back then, man, we were just guessing and trying to figure it out. And that's sort of where this whole 
communal planting and raised beds came in, you know, the, we had them all in fabric pots and they were all touching and the roots were growing together. We're like, Oh, well, why don't we just go to a bed if we're going to reuse the soil? So a lot of this stuff dates back quite a ways. Um, so in terms of the soils on our company, I, we're one of the first, I think we're outside of TGA super soil. We're the first, uh, company to come out with a water only soil mix. And for me, when I first started, the idea was if you were a cancer patient or a medical patient, you know, trying to run a bottled nutrient line or trying to add all these fertilizers didn't make sense. I wanted to be able to give you a soil that you could literally just water your plant and know you'll get healthy medicine at the end of the day. Since then, we found all these different other applications and the whole living soil movement has really caught on. And now we've really looked at how do we dial in and the fertility um, and really get the science involved with soil testing. And so that's where we're at now with our soils that we offer is you know, we, we try, we balance all of the minerals in them. We put as much fertility as we can into the soil and we utilize soil testing with a lot of the commercial facilities that we work with, um, as a way of keeping that fertility optimal cycle after cycle and getting really consistent results. So yeah, if people want to try the soil, uh, we do have it available on our website. We have a bunch of options. Um, yeah, yeah. appreciate it. Well, well, now um, I, can go I, ahead. Can I ask about the um, the mix, the living soil mix? Um, like with a Kutz mix, you can usually do a series of compost teas that will kind of get you through each run, and you can get multiple, multiple runs. Can you? Is that kind of the same thing with the back soil, where you'll have a set uh, tea recipe for folks to follow so that they can kind of keep things going as as things chug along? Yeah. So for, for us, if you're in a seven gallon pot or larger, assuming you don't veg all that long, you should be able to make it a full cycle with just water. That being said, there are other things that you can do, but, um, again, we try to simplify it and I'm not trying to sell you on like, if I, if I recommend 10 products to do during your grow, you might as well buy a bottle of nutrient line at that point. You know what I mean? So, um, the idea is that the water is the, the soil is, is water only in a complete solution. Um, Trying to get back to your question, though. Um, yeah, so cycle after cycle. Again, it's the idea we're moving, we're removing organic matter, we're removing carbon, removing nutrients. Um, ideally, those would be replaced every cycle. Your compost tea is going to bring in some of those things as well as microbiology, but or or nutrient tea, I guess we didn't specify, but it's gonna vary on nutrient content and on uh, biological content, every brew. And so it gets, it just gets a little bit, uh, fuzzy in terms of trying to dial that in, but you absolutely could do that. I just wouldn't be able to say with the same degree of confidence that you'll get replicable results every cycle, whether using Coots mix or, you know, one of our soils, uh, or anyone's soils really. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely a possibility. Okay. Well then <clears throat> let's jump into, um, talking about, getting ready for the growth season. I've got a bunch of um, questions that I put together for you today um, where I was essentially thinking through all the things that come to mind as I grow, uh, I grow outdoors. So like, um, you know, in my backyard, I'm in Northern California. I grow in like 30 gallon pots. I've also got, I've got, did one plant fully in the ground last year, which was just fun to see how big that one grew versus the other ones. Um, and I'm using organic soil. I've been, I switched over to organic I don't know, three, four years ago. And I'm just learning every single year <laughs> through trial and error. So anyways, that's kind of the background for where some of my questions are coming from. Um, so anyways, as we kind of get ready for the grow season, we're recording this right now in mid to late March. So I'm starting to think about how I'm going to get ready for putting plants in the ground in June or something like that. Um, what, what can I, uh, do to reamend soil that I used in previous years or maybe last season? How can I reamend that soil to get it ready for this, uh, next grow season? And then also feel free to explicitly mention products because I'm literally going to be going on your site later and buying some of this stuff. So feel free to mention things too, just so people can okay. go on your site and, you know, know what to look for. But yeah, just, I'd love to, um, hear your take on how should folks re-amend soil to get ready for the new grow season? 
Yeah, and I'm going to try to stay away from products as much as possible, but I'll give you some options if you want. But um, the way I, I want to just back up a little bit. So the way you the way you want to look at your soil, and we're not talking about true soil here. We're talking about probably potting soil, right? What we call living soils in a lot of cases. Yeah. Um, it's usually peat based or cocoa based. Um, in his case, I think it's amended big roots. Yeah, okay. soil king stuff. But yeah, anyway, yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. So so saying. it's potting soil. Okay. Um, so keep in mind that the metrics for that are going to be different than they would be for actual soil, sand, silt, and clay. Um, and so it's important if you're if you do get a soil test and you're working with an agronomist, uh, that they understand those differences. We do work with Logan Labs, they're one of the more popular labs in the industry right now. Um, uh, and uh you can get a soil test directly through us and get a recommendation as well. I think it runs like 90 bucks. Now that's only worth it. If you have enough soil that you're amending, you know, if you have just a couple 30 gallon pots or you're in a tent, it's probably not worth the cost of getting the soil test, but it is the only way to know for sure what's in that soil. Now you said you're in Northern California. I, let's just create a scenario here that the pots have been sitting outside. Um, Let's assume, and I'm just talking about the nutrient part right now. Let's assume that you've had some rains and things like that over the winter. So those pots are probably going to be fairly leached of nutrients, specifically nitrogen, your nitrates and, and potassium. You probably still have some phosphorus in there. You probably still have some calcium and magnesium, but I'm going to want to amend those two nutrients at a little bit higher rates than I would other, other things. I'm, I, I, my, just from looking at you know thousands of tests, you probably have sufficient magnesium. I wouldn't add any magnesium inputs at all unless you see an actual deficiency. And then so that means I'm focusing on adding things like alfalfa meal, blood meal, fish meal are all great options for um, nitrogen. If we're talking about phosphorus and calcium, uh, fish bone meal is a really good source. Bone meal, those are probably the, the top two. I personally don't recommend guanos just because of the ecological impact and sustainability around them, but they both work or they work as well. Um, and then for calcium, if you have a pH meter and your pH is low, let's say, you know, five, five to six, five, and you want to raise it, then I'd use oyster shell flour or egg lime. Otherwise, if your pH is already six, six to seven, two, uh, then I'd stick with something like gypsum. Uh, and and that's those are the things that I would look at initially. So you wouldn't recommend strategy. you wouldn't recommend like getting a charge pack and just like throwing it on there and hoping everything's good. So that that would be the the simple way to do it if you don't want to you know go through the testing or 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 guess as much. We do offer something called our nutrient pack, and what that is is it's a combination of like fifteen different organic amendments. It's what we put into our soil. So you could literally make a kiss soil mix from scratch or use it to reamend, um, you know, old soil that you've already had. So yes. And we give you rates for that without a soil test. We're guessing a little bit, like, I don't yeah. know what teas and stuff you might've applied or what the phosphorus levels are in your old soil, but I, I can guess. And then I, one thing I didn't talk about that I meant to is that when you're thinking about soil, you really need to think about three aspects of that soil. And I, I use a triangle, but you can use pillar column, whatever, however you want to think about this. But we've been talking about the chemical properties of the soil when we talk about nutrients and fertilizer. But you also need to consider the biological aspects of that soil because that's what's cycling the nutrients in an organic system and bringing out the really unique terpenes and cannabinoids and, and that sort of stuff. And then lastly, the physical properties of the soil. So your, your old soil, the bulk density is probably increased. It's probably shrunk down uh, since the year before. You may need to add a little more compost or you may need a little more peat or you may want to add a little bit more aeration in the form of pumice or perlite or vermiculite, whatever you have access to, to make sure that the soil has good porosity and air exchange and drainage, and there's not a lot of compaction. So all of those things will impact root health, which is ultimately the most important thing when we talk right. about plant health. Yeah, I, I appreciate that JR pointed out the kits or kind of the pre-mixed stuff, because I'll just be honest, that's what I'm used to buying. Um, you know, I've used various brands, um, you know, that you can get and you can get like rose and flower mixes or whatever, you know, those sorts of things. Um, 
you know, that are uh, whatever the MPK ratios typically are. And I've used those and I found those to be really helpful. And I was, I went onto your site and I noticed that you had some different options, right? There's like Coots mm -hmm. mix. Um, I think you have like your own blend. Could you just talk through those just to help people understand, um, what they're looking at when they're on your site and what, why they might want to pick one or, or the other? Yeah. So the Coots mix one is, is basically the recipe I got from Coot. Uh, and that, that's, you know, neem, crab, kelp, uh, malta barley, those sorts of things in the ratios that he uses, he would use them in. Um, he also, one of the things I should point out though, is that Coot talks about how you're never really growing in Coots mix because you don't have his earthworm castings. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. So I think you can get mixed results. One other thing about that is just knowing the heavy metals in crab and kelp. I've backed off my usage of those quite a bit, like especially like with our nutrient pack and our soils. So I would assume that that mix would be higher in heavy metals than uh, our nutrient pack because we're we're using our nutrient pack in our soils in a lot of commercial grows that are regulated for heavy metals in pretty tight states like California. And so we want to make sure we keep those as low as possible. And even just for your own health, I think that's a good idea. So uh, the level of fertility in the KISS nutrient pack as well as the heavy metal load are, uh, I would say, higher level fertility, lower level of heavy, heavy metals. But you know, that being said, I've seen some great plants growing with cute mix. People love it. Um, it, it, but it, it I kind of want to go back. I'd like to go back to what you said, Dad, because at the end of the day, the genetics you bring into your farm determine what a lot of your uh, passability and testing. And then the inputs mm -hmm. that you bring into your farm are going to determine. And a lot of people will stack stuff and not realizing that each one of those little things has a little bit of this or that. And then pretty soon they have a, li a larger load that then they're failing tests. And so when you have a product like yours that is cleanly sourced, water only, you know what your inputs are going to be. They've already been done in a formula that works that's going to be repeatable. And I think that consistency and repeatable is something that's important. And can you kind of speak to... Uh, your uh, fight to keep things consistent and repeatable in your product, especially your living soil product. Yeah. So, and I don't know your audience that well. Uh, we, we work with primarily like not primarily, but a lot of commercial facilities uh, all around the country. And so for us, it's a lot of testing because we know that our soil is going to bring in some level of heavy metals. It's unavoidable. We keep that level as low as possible. But then we work with the growers on their testing and their, you know, seeing how their genetics are responding to the fertility and what sorts of heavy metals they're taking up each cycle. And then we're managing that. Uh, you know, the heavy metal conversation is very complicated because pH plays a big role, hydrology and the way you water plays a big role. Um, your genetics, like you mentioned, uh, there's a bunch of abiotic factors in terms of how you manage your room that will affect it. And then also how you harvest. So even just pulling newer buds versus older buds for testing will test lower. Um, those lower leaves on your plant are going to be higher in heavy metals than the leaves, the, the newer leaves and new growth. Your roots are going to be higher in heavy metals um, and hop latent viroid, um, in, coincidentally, than other parts of your plant. So we we take all of this information and we we strategize with the growers so that we can create a, a program that's going to have the highest chance of passing. Um, at the end of the day, we're talking about parts per million in a lot of cases, even parts per billion on some of these things. So yep. um, it's very easy for sampling error, lab error, you know, genetics to play a huge role. Um, so we can't guarantee a pass, but but I can say that with with a lot of confidence that we can come pretty uh, pretty close to to a level of consistency where I feel comfortable saying living soil can work even under these really tough regulatory. Uh, conditions in some states okay um well let's see i have a couple questions that are uh near and dear to me as i kind of think through this process um the first one is i guess i'd kind of summarize and 
we're kind of we're preparing for the season, right? So I I was just asking you about like how am I reamending the soil? Um, I guess a quick question on that is. Um, how far out do you recommend people reamend their soil if they're getting ready for the season? Because it's mm-hmm. starting to get nice around here, so I'm like, oh shit, it's start to, starting to. I should be growing soon, but I, I won't. You know, from previous experience, I probably shouldn't actually put my cannabis plants in the ground until like June, so I've got some time. But um, what? How um, how far out should people reamend? And then also a real quick question on that too. Um, how should they reamend? Because one of the questions that comes to mind to me when I'm doing my research and actually trying to figure out like how much stuff I should buy when I'm trying to figure out quantities is figuring out how am I reamending it. So if I have a 30 gallon pot, I'm probably not reamending all 30 gallons of se- uh, of soil with you know your recharge pack or whatever you call it. Um, I'm probably reamending a portion of that. How uh, can you talk? me through that like how how do I approach that am I like scraping off a certain amount of the topsoil and reamending that or how how do you uh suggest people go through that so if you're let's start with outdoor so if you're outdoor in containers um I would wait until after spring is over so maybe let's say two three weeks before you plan on planting would be a good general time because you're going to have a lot of rains and we don't want to potentially leach the nutrients that we're adding into the soil back out back out of the pot so i like to amend personally um fairly homogenous so i would amend that whole pot assuming um assuming it's not not too compacted because we want to again get oxygen down all the way through the whole pot um we want to make sure that everything is homogenous so that the roots have Roots have access to nutrients throughout their entire growth cycle. Um, one thing I will touch on, and since uh, <laughs> I think JR is already thinking about it, is this idea that soil disturbance kills soil biology. Um, so people are, I know people are big on no-till because they don't want to damage soil structure. And I think that that's really admirable and makes a ton of sense in agriculture. But keep in mind, like you digging in with your hands and a shovel is not the same as a rototiller coming through and just shredding everything to death. Um, these microbes are very resilient. And, uh, I I see huge advantages to mixing nutrients into the rhizosphere down into the pot further rather than just top dressing. So that's sort of our strategy. Now, if you were in an indoor grow, like a tent, let's just say a a living soil bed indoors. uh, If you're a commercial facility that we work with, we're typically re-amending and um, 24 to 36 hours after harvest, we've got our next crop in there. So you'd harvest your plant, uh, come back in with the, amendments that are needed to get the soil back up to the level fertility you had to start the cycle. And then, you know, 24, 36 hours later, you're uh, bringing in your next crop. So there's no downtime because we need to be able to get in at least five cycles a year, if not six. So um, that's, that's one big difference in terms of how you'd reamend. If you're just doing one outdoor cycle um, in a perfect world, I'd add, I'd add the calcium in the fall and then everything else in the spring, but realistically probably just add everything in the spring. If you're using our nutrient pack, it has all of that in there along with trace, trace minerals and everything else. And you can just add it um, two, three weeks before you go to go to start growing. And so now in my 30 gallon pot that I have over winter sitting outside the, all that biology that I had created over the year uh, has now winterized. Uh, how much of that biology is dormant? Is it dead? How do I get my biology and all that cellular goodness going again? So when you add nutrients, like if we were at our nutrient pack or really any fertilizer, any food source, whether that's a tea, you know, even just some unsulfured blackstrap molasses, alfalfa meal, all those things are food sources for microbes. So any fertilizer you add is going to feed the microbes. They're resilient. They're designed to go through this sort of process. They do it every year in nature. They can handle temperatures. They can handle changes. Um, And you have to remember their lifetimes are in the period of like minutes to hours. So reproduction happens very quickly, especially for bacteria and archaea. So, um, I, I I don't worry too much about the microbes. I try to have take like regenerative ag practices 
Um, so like outdoors in your pot, I would have suggested that you cover it, you know, rather than just leaving it open to help retain moisture, whether that's a mulch, I, I would just take some old, probably some old maple leaves from my yard and just cover that pot and then forget about it for the winter sort of thing. And they'll protect the pot, break things down, um, and stuff like that. But I think the microbes take care of themselves 90% of the time. Nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I guess the only, I'll be honest, the only pushback I have on your answer is that, um, like in my case, I'm talking about like almost 200 gallons of soil. So to dump out 200 gallons of soil, just being honest, sounds kind of like a ridiculous idea. Um, but, um, but yeah, how, what do you suggest people do in those sorts of situations? Just, yeah. just well, first of all, I love pushback. Let's make it a discussion. Like yeah. that's the whole point. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Yeah. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm, I want to hear it. So <laughs> the way I would deal with that. So if we're talking about a 200 gallon pot, I would amend directly in the pot itself uh, to a six inch depth. Just making sure that the soil below that is not just very compact or waterlogged or anything like that and has the right physical properties. But you don't need to amend that full pot. If we're talking about 30-gallon pots, then I would just get in there with my hands and just try and mix it together a little more homogeneously. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't need to dump it all out into a pile. Okay. Um, I think that's fine. And if you don't want to do that, if you're like, nope, I don't want to disturb my soil at all. You can top dress. Just know that you're going to have to top dress at a lower rate and then top dress again down the road as a way of getting the same level of fertility into that pot. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. No, I appreciate the discussion. Well, um, continuing on then, um, one of the – and my next few questions that I had, central, uh, one of them you just kind of touched on was about top dressing. I'm going to put that to the side. The next few that I want to focus on is basically how I, can I set myself up for success as an outdoor grower because – Outdoor growing is really hard. It's not growing in any kind of, you know, scenario has its challenges, but growing outdoors in particular, I'm just getting all sorts of different bugs at different times of year and all sorts of things. And I've, as a part of my process of like trying to fight this stuff back, I've wondered what could I be putting into my soil or are there things that I could be putting into my soil that help my plant fight back these things so that I'm not dealing with whatever random bugs it is in yeah. July or August or September or whatever. So, and I've, I know people have talked about neem and some other things, but I've, I've always wondered how much to buy into it. So I'd be curious if you have any like pro tips or suggestions of like, what can I add to my soil or things that I could do in the beginning that are going to make sure that my plant like fights off these things or doesn't have to deal with these problems as much. That is a very loaded question. Uh, and it's complicated. <laughs> the answer is Good complicated. Job, so <laughs> IPM integrated pest management is this idea of how do we manage our crop as efficiently as possible to prevent all the pests and diseases like you're talking about. Now, there's certain things that are best practices, like um, don't take in clones from from sources you're un, you're unaware of. Like that's how we're spreading disease. Um, you know, in an indoor facility, make sure you change clothes before you go visit your buddies grow or you know things like that will help keep from spreading these pests. Now, w the first thing that I think of when you say, how do I make my plant stronger to be able to fight this off? I think there's two things. Well, three things here now that I think about it. So the first one would be uh, silica. I did a whole podcast with Dr. Wendy Zellner on silica. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so raising your silica levels in your soil will, will play a huge role. And you have to be careful because, um, there's a lot of sources of silica that are not readily available. So if it's coming from like, a a rock dust or, or, a or it's some sort of silicon dioxide, it's going to be less available. Uh, I like to use potassium silicate or calcium silicate. So potassium silicate, it's what's in Dynago Grow Protect. It's what's in silica blast. A lot of these different silica products, you can buy the powdered version from our website or from other companies that sell it. And basically you take it and make up your own liquid silica product that you can then, uh, water in. Yeah, you know, I think it's like a teaspoon per gallon of the concentrate. So you can make a, a pound of it, it'll make about a gallon of concentrate. So a little goes a long way. And then you would feed that to your plant throughout the growing cycle. Um, well, last tonight is calcium silicate. 
it, you could use it in, instead of using lime. It's going to raise your pH, but slower than something like agricultural lime. And that's another great way to get silica in there. And then lastly, diatomaceous earth also is another form of silica that will become available if you top dress or let's say you're using it for fungus gnats or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's not a bad way to go either. That will also give you silica as well. Is that available um, pretty quickly? Because I I've I found um, diatomaceous earth in recent years because like you can randomly come across a bunch of it at like pet stores and stuff like that. I've noticed. Um, so I've kind of experimented a little bit with it. it does the plant take up uh, you know what it needs from diatomaceous earth pretty quickly, or can you just I guess double click on diatomaceous earth real quick for me? Yeah, it's not going to be as readily available as potassium silicate, but yeah. if it's if it's a very fine powder, like flour, has a larger particle size, it would become available. And here, no one can give you the exact answer to this because there's so many variables around the microbes in the soil and the physical um, water, moisture levels and all of those things, temperature, those are all going to play a role too. But um, in general, it would be available that cycle. I could say pretty confidently based on the research I've seen. So, um, yeah. And the thing is, if you, if you keep adding it consistently, you know, if you're consistently adding carbon, if you're kissing, adding silica, these things will stick around and be available, um, for future cycles. If you are reusing your soil. Cool. Yeah. I've used diatomaceous earth a lot. Cause I have, um, problems with, like snails and slugs in my backyard. And so mm -hmm. when I just start putting out clones in the beginning of the season, um, I've had issues with those sorts of creatures. And so I've used, experimented with um, these various things. Um, well, so I guess before I let you move on to the next subject, I'm going to pin you on neem. So I think you use neem in your some of your mixes. Um, could does neem create a systemic uh, response in the plant that helps it fight off these various things? Could you just help me understand, like, is neem helpful? And should I, I guess, should I make sure that I'm using it in my soil? Because I noticed you even have, like, neem pellets that I could grind up and make my own, like, neem meal and, and use that. Yeah, so the neem dates back to coot back in the day um, when I first started making soils. I can't change what's in my soil without re-registering and relabeling, and it's a huge pain in the ass, so I don't do it. Um, I've moved away from neem a little bit. Now, here's what I'll say about neem. So the, the bad about neem is it's coming from India, so it has a larger fossil fuel cost. You, we can get those same nutrient levels from other closer, least, closer sourced uh, amendments. Um, neem can have, or neem will have azadiractin in it, which uh, is a known insect neural disruptor. If I, I hope I'm saying that right. I, I'll have to go back and look, but um, it has known effects on certain insects. So that's so why people. Like, sorry, Chad. Are you saying like colony killers? Um, like bee colonies. It, 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 neem will kill bees, not not the pellets, but the oil. If you spray it on a bee, I, so it, it works in two different ways. It has azadiractin in there which there's synthetically derived azadiractin products like sure, azatrol sure. and azamax sure. but then it also it's also an oil so it works as a suffocant in that <clears throat> regard now the thing about neem the the reason i don't use it as if we're talking about as an oil-based spray as much is because um one, there's research that shows that beneficial insects or pollinators and stuff won't come back to the leaf surface as rapidly as if you were to spray uh, something else that's not neem based. Like, um, you know, like I, I really like a product called Suff Oil X. It's a yeah. it's a mineral oil based product. Um, it's also you can, if you're not a large scale grower and can't buy Suff Oil, you can also get it as Monterey uh, horticultural oil, and that you can find anywhere. It's the same product. Um, and then there's a new one called Epishield that's a botanical based product from Bioworks as well that also has similar effects. I haven't used Lost Coast plant therapy, so I can't speak to you it. You should try. They're a sponsor. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. No, but right. um, but uh, yeah, so that's why I don't use Nemo as much. Plus, I did have one grower that I heard about through an uh, entomologist friend of mine that failed for um, some 
conventional pesticides that haven't been allowed in the U.S. since the 1970s. And this was due to something that had been yep. sprayed on the neem tree itself, concentrated yep. in the oil, and they didn't know when they got it. So, yes, the neem that we carry, I feel very good about, but I don't always recommend it. Now, one thing that I did do back in the day with neem cake, um, I think – Coot was actually the one who should get credited for this is he told me to take two cups. I had a really bad fungus gnat infestation, yeah, I, indoor grow. So I took two cups of neem cake, not the oil, but the, the seed meal and put it into water, five gallon bucket. I used my compost heaper and I aerated it for 24, 36 hours, somewhere around there. And then I took that water and I just watered my plants with it. And that wiped out the uh fungus gnats i was really impressed with that. it just knocked them back a ton so um, i um uh, i had a similar experience i um ran i uh, had a, a brief friendship with a lady called ne uh, neem ninja and she sent me home with a bunch of neem cake and i was having the same issue and i just put like an inch of neem cake over the top of every pot and there were within i mean there was just no fungus gnats after that and I noticed I even had that kind of, uh, when I watered in, it kind of created this like fuzzy layer of, it wasn't like mycelium, but it was like this moldy type stuff that looked pretty beneficial and stuff. So um, I, moving forward though, I wanted to kind of touch on that idea that people say that the genetics of the plant build resistance. And then if your plant is healthy enough with its immune system, that you don't need IPM. Uh, would you say that that is a false statement and that you would always wanna have some sort of IPM implementation, whether your genetics and health is solid or not? Yes. <laughs> uh, to answer in, in a, little, a little deeper though, like, uh, I, man, I, I would challenge any, this idea that you can raise BRICS levels or that you can have a plant so healthy that it won't, it won't be susceptible to pests or disease is frankly, I it's garbage. Um, Thank you. There's a lot of research out there and I, I am good. One of my best friends is really like the top uh, ornamental or ornamental entomologist and cannabis entomologist in the United States, Suzanne Wainwright Evans. And I've talked to her about this. And basically what she shares is like when pest pressure reaches a certain level, they're going to eat your plant. If that's Ooh. one of their target food sources, they will eat it. Now, here's what's true about this and makes it confusing is plants that are overfed nitrogen that have too much nitrates in their tissue or plants that are stressed already are going to be more susceptible to those pests. So if you have two plants in your yard, two cannabis plants, and one of them is struggling, maybe it's root bound, maybe, maybe it didn't get the right level of fertility, you know, maybe something else was going on, it wasn't watered correctly. That plant is more likely to be susceptible to pests and disease than your super healthy plant. But I guarantee if that spider mite pressure or the thrips or cannabis aphid or broad mite gets high enough, they're going to, they're going to scoot right on over there and feast away. So you always need to have good IPM. I mean, the, the same goes for bricks. There's no correlation there between bricks levels and pest resistance. It, it's just a measure of of sugar and other carbohydrates in the sap or leaf tissue. It doesn't it doesn't correlate like we want it to 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 pest resistance. All right. Well, I have because I'm not blessed enough to uh, be able to get grow plants that don't have bug issues. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna double uh, we're gonna talk about bug issues real quick as we kind of get into the home stretch of our interview today. Um, so yeah, just talking through again outdoor growing um, for me in my experience, things really start to heat up in terms of bugs and stuff in uh, again i'm in north america in like july august september i'm dealing with various things it's like aphids sometimes it's thrips it's spider mites sometimes it's all those at the same time um i also deal with caterpillars really hardcore um throughout the the that whole time period so um Another th thing that I'll add before I get to my actual question is uh, I was also excited when I was on your site that you sell bugs now, too, which was Ooh. really cool because uh, yeah. I have I spend a decent amount of money on bugs every year. So um, 
Can you talk folks through how can I fight these various bugs? What can I do to set myself up for success? Cause it's just so heartbreaking. Like every year my wife asks me basically like how many plants I had to throw away. And yes, I know nature always gets its cut as we say, JR. Thank you. Thank but, uh, you. but yeah, how can I make sure that nature doesn't get as much of a cut and what sort of <laughs> things should I be, should I be using or thinking about using? Yeah, let me start by saying I am not an entomologist. Um, I am friends with a lot of entomologists, so I've sort of gleaned a lot of uh, the information that I do have through osmosis, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Um, I will give you some key points that I consider that I've learned from, again, Suzanne and, and Kelly and some of my other good friends in the industry. So it always starts with positive identification. And this doesn't mean going on a Facebook group or Instagram and asking like, what is this pest? People get it wrong more often than you would think. And a lot of times what people think is a pest is not necessarily even a pest. I've had people with, you know, mold mites that, that are food sources that come with their beneficials and they think, oh my gosh, I need to spray something. And really these things have no economic impact on your plant or like, uh, Leaf miners would be another example of that. Yes, you'll find them in cannabis, but they don't have an economic impact. They're not going to impact your yield, so you don't need to spray anything for them or really worry about them. Um, according to Kelly, who used to work over at Beneficial and Sectory. Um, but it all starts with a positive ID. And there's even different types of, you know, different types of powdery mildew different that, that can survive at different um, humidity levels. And so knowing these things are different, there's different types of thrips, you know, whether you have onion thrips or uh, whatever, whatever it is, unless you get a really good identification, uh, you don't know where to start with what you need to apply or how you need to deal with it. Because how you deal with an aphid is very different than how you deal with thrips or spider mites yes. or whatever it is. So I can't emphasize that enough. And then you Number brought a beneficial- one, identification. Yeah, you brought up beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. I I love beneficial insects. Um, pests cannot develop a resistance to being eaten, which is huge. <laughs> uh, yeah. They can develop resistance to chemistries, to pesticides, but not to other bugs. And they'll be working in your garden while you're sleeping, and it's mm. just a wonderful thing. That being said, it's an expensive point of entry because of shipping costs, because they have to be shipped overnight. You want to make sure you're getting them from someone who's shipping them directly from the insectary. If they're going to a middleman, getting repackaged, the viability when they arrive is not going to be as high potentially as you would want them to be. So that's really important. Um, if you are applying pesticides, always make sure you apply them at the label rate. I was someone who thought, I'm going to be more eco-friendly. I'm going to apply this at less than what they say I need to apply it, um, thinking I was doing the right thing. What I was actually doing was getting less efficacy, so a, a worse kill rate, because they figured this stuff out for you. Um, I wasn't really impacting my phytotoxicity, but I was creating pests that were going to be more resistant. They were potentially going to develop genetic resistance just to the pesticide that I'm applying. So the next time around, it won't be as effective. So, and that's a big problem across the industry now. So always apply it, whatever the label rate is, always wear proper PPE when you're applying anything. I even like to wear a mask when I'm mixing soils and things like that, because we're kicking up all this dust. It's not good for you to breathe it. Um, so those are all things. And, and then the last thing I just want to remind folks in case you haven't heard it is don't buy ladybugs. Um, yeah. Ladybugs are, are they're wild harvested in 99% of the case, and that has a negative impact on your local ladybug population because it can they can spread pests and diseases. So I just want to recommend to folks not to buy ladybugs, but there are a lot of really good beneficial insects that you can purchase for your garden. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of nematodes. <laughs> Sorry guys, uh, that's, that's all good. So great. I'm a, I'm a brand new dad um, as of a few months ago, so it's all good, man. Oh, uh, congratulations! <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, we're wrapping up on the final couple of questions. I guess Jr. Did you uh, want to throw in one? Yeah, and I'll throw in one I as well. Have one, I have one more. I really want to hammer down for people. Um, a lot of the uh, combination I like to tell folks to use if they're having fungus gnat issues 
is nematodes and rove beetles. Uh, can you? One of the things about nematodes I find frustrating is I don't know they're there. I don't know that I've applied them right. I don't mm -hmm. know they're brewed right. I've always in the past gotten these janky sponges, and I don't even know, you know, what's going on. So can you kind of speak to really good practices for your nematode uh, purchasing and uh, processing to make sure they're working properly? And then if you can, touch on rove beetles. Sure. So uh, the the nematodes, the SF nematodes, uh, diner name of Feltier, I think is, is the official name of it, because there's a few different commercially reared nematodes you can buy, but you want SF nematodes for what you're talking about if you're dealing with fungus gnats. They will eat and target other things. Like I think they also target thrips in the soil yep. as well. So yep. they have, uh, they're, they're amazing. They're like the best thing for fungus gnats. Um, there are other options like BTI and, and a few other things like you mentioned with DE, but I love, I love the nematodes too. Um, in terms of application, you can store them in your fridge somewhere cool. You want to wake them up uh, a little before, like bring them into your room, let them sit for a little while, uh, add them to water that's not too warm, but not freezing cold. Um, and then essentially stir them in the bucket and water them in with a watering can or something. You can check for viability with them. You can actually see the nematodes, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's an option. Just under like a cheap micro, like your little uh, 100,000 X mic electronic microscope you get off Amazon, you can see the nematodes in there doing their thing. Sure. Yeah. They're not that small. Yeah. You can see them. Okay, good. And then um, now, um, uh, rove beetles can you talk a little bit about uh what they're going to be offering to the party yeah they're generalists as well as i understand it again this is <laughs> this is a little outside my window i have a guy on my staff that handles a lot of this stuff for me if you go on our website and i'm actually just going there now and you say <laughs> uh we have a we have a main page um, but if you say target let's just say thrips yeah. So we'll have a thing with the thrips life cycle. We'll have information about them and then we'll have different insects that work against, you know, work against thrips, or you can click on the rove beetle website and it'll talk about specifically what pests rove beetles work with, um, you know, what application rates look like all of that. So yeah, we have a ton of information on our website about IPM. Um, I don't, have it all memorized unfortunately that's and fine that's fine that's um, all good we're so we're so yeah. happy and, and and really uh you know kind of blessed to have someone like you on our show so we're stoked um oh, well, well thank you yeah, i'm a thanks. soil guy we can talk soil all day but when it comes to insects and that sort of stuff it's really outside my lane it's all good well me and, me and sam have noticed that you know the way you've kind of built the foundation for the site and for your business, um, you're really you're really gearing up to do well, my friend. And I'm really excited about all the services, the education, all the products, all the sourcing, all the attention to care and your relationships with other people in the industry and in the community. All that stuff builds up to, to the momentum that you're creating now. And I, I got to say, I'm really excited for you, Todd. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Honor. Yeah. Yeah. And the last thing, uh, we don't have to talk about it, but I w did want to shout out something that I noticed on your website that I think people should check out, um, which is on the topic of watering. So blue mots. Um, I'm a big believer in blue mots. I think I probably heard about them from you actually, now that I think about it, um, hmm. like years ago and, um, you know, ordered directly from their site and I have used it in various situations. I've set up big, um, it's pretty cheap for me to get big, uh, drums that are used to st store, um, olives. And then I've converted those into like watering canisters nice. or whatever you want to call it, rot water reservoirs. So I just want to shout out blue Mutts. Um, and if you are, if you're watching this and you want to have a, a really great, easy way to water your plants and water them consistently, check out blue Mutts. There's a little bit to learn about them. So Tad's company, um, provides like custom blue blue mots like designs so definitely check that out that's really useful and i really love blue mots they've been really useful to me um growing outside and indoors um, yeah 
go ahead. Yeah, I can touch on that. I just want to touch on that really quick. So, so essentially what blue bats are is a little tensiom tensiometer. It's a little carrot that measures moisture tension and then maintains that in your soil. So it doesn't at the same level. So it doesn't use electricity and it'll be watering as the plant needs it through various stages of growth. Um, as the roots expand, need more water, you know, it's, it's going to water more. If it rains, if you're outdoors, it's not going to add more water because it, the soil is already at the moisture levels that, that you want. So it's a great way if you, to get your watering evened out. And we have a blue mat design through KISS that is, I believe, uh, not only more affordable, but more efficient than some of the other ones that I'm seeing out there. So um, if you are interested in trying it out, hit us up because I think we can save you some money on a more efficient design. And there's actually a whole research paper uh, on our website that we that we did a white paper on using utilizing blue mats in a, in a commercial facility here in Washington State. So yeah, we work with people on everything from irrigation, lighting, uh, beneficial insects, soil amendments, soil testing. Uh, we're kind of, we're kind of trying to be a one-stop shop in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, for, what kind of lighting? I mean, I know you're not a lighting guy, but just throw out, uh, what lighting manufacturers and stuff are you working with? Yeah. I've learned a ton about lighting over the last, uh, five years. Uh, I actually got to get, uh, Dr. Bruce Bugby on the podcast a little while ago, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we work currently right now with BIOS lighting. I've worked with Fluence Ooh, and Science yeah. Lights in the past, but now we work exclusively with BIOS. They're a NASA spinoff, um, former NASA engineers, which I think is so cool. I'm a, I'm a big NASA fan uh, from growing up. And uh, the quality of their lights is amazing. They're, uh, I believe it's IP66, IP65. They're waterproof. Uh, rating is, is the highest in the industry and they have a seven year warranty, which no one else is doing. Um, so I, I think it speaks to the quality and customer service that they provide. It's what I grow with here at my house. Um, I, I love their lights. I, I can't recommend them enough. Um, happy to, if anyone's interested, uh, reach out and I can get, I can put you in touch You can get a free lighting, lighting design and get, you know, what you need for your, for your setup. Nice. Well, and that's kind of one of the missing links for us here at Cannabis is we really haven't landed on a lighting manufacturer group that we really want to stand behind fully yet. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah you should you should check out check them out. I'd be happy to introduce you. One one thing I will say is they're not the cheapest lights. They're kind of on par with like Fluence and Foch and those sorts of things. Um, they're not the most expensive lights they're they're definitely that you're getting quality for the price but this is not like a 200 dollars fixture or anything like that sure yeah. sure sure yeah sure. for sure well um i'm gonna let you go i really appreciate you spending the time this afternoon i know we had to reschedule and things like that so really appreciate your flexibility and working with us and just the i hope this is the start of a good relationship i really appreciate your the knowledge that you share with this community like i said you were really important to me getting started as a grower and i really appreciate wow. your voice and the knowledge that you provide and the value that you provide to the community it's um definitely appreciated by me and many others in the community so thank you for all that you do hey i'm honored thanks for having me and just in case anyone wants to find me uh i didn't mention the podcast one time i'm so bad at this so i have a podcast called cannabis cultivation and science we're over 100 episodes in now um a lot of great research and conversations on there and i think that's how you found us actually oh yeah uh, sam originally so i i'm i appreciate it thanks for having me on yeah it's a really great podcast it's a great like if you want to listen to the knucklehead smoking weed show and and our show it's great and then you can listen to tad's <laughs> tad's uh show uh or and like get real Shango science. show yeah or like yeah Shango. <laughs> yeah they're all the really great important parts of the ecosystem them. But um, yeah. Tad, thank you so much for your time. If you really enjoyed this episode, make sure to check out kissorganics.com. That's K-I-S organics.com. All the stuff that we talked about today is up there. Really great resources, great products on there. Uh, thanks again to Tad. Thanks, JR, for helping put toge together today's episode. And as always, everyone, growers, growers love. love. Peace. <laughs>